what's up everybody? Stevie Stroh, the original gamer, and I'm really excited to share something with everybody today. What we are looking at here on the screen in vivid rainbow beautiness is my first computer, my original computer. The single piece of equipment that literally changed my life and made me the person who I am today. And maybe some of you who know me might think that's not a good thing. However, this computer that we're looking at, the Radio Shack TRS-80 color computer, or as those of us who owned and loved them like to call this, the Coco. So the color computer was one I got when I was a kid. I got my computer... 1981 I think I was probably around 14 years old a lot of things were happening in the world that really inspired my mind to be interested in not only video games but computers and technology so let's take a little stroll down memory lane and talk about a lot of things that happened in the 80s and then we'll get into my favorite computer so in the 80s what the heck was going on in the 80s here? Well, I'll tell you what was going on. One of the things that was happening was arcade games were happening. And uh, games like Space Invaders and Asteroids and Pong. And then later on, Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and all these games. These were things that literally never existed before. These were new, exciting, amazing things. We had never seen video screens. We had never seen computer graphics. We would never heard this computerized music and the ability to use a joystick and play a game was exciting, especially to me. I was maybe 12 years old when this stuff happened and my brain was like just exploded because it was just so amazing and, and intriguing to me. So when these games came out, um, and the only place you could play these games were in the arcades. You had to go to an arcade or maybe there's one in your bowling alley or in your convenience store or drug store, but you had to leave your house and you had to go there and you had to spend money to play these games. That was the only way you could do it. So the popularity of these led to home game systems. And one of the earliest ones was the Pong machine. The Pong had two paddles. You turned the paddles, you moved the little line up and down the screen and a little square ball bounced back and forth and it was poor man's video tennis. But it was amazing at the time because we'd never seen it before. A lot of people had Pong machines and that's all you could play was Pong. And you played Pong and you were happy, right? Um, Pong led to one of the most famous game systems of all time which was the Atari 2600 video computer system. The Atari system gave us joysticks, still had paddles, and instead of it being only one game that was built in, you could plug in a cartridge and you could change the games. And so because Atari was making arcade systems, real arcade machines, they knew how to do this, right? So they built in a scaled down version of some of the technologies that were in the bigger arcade machines. But because it was meant for the home, because it was meant for a television, because it was meant to be somewhat affordable, it didn't have the same level of processing power, of graphical power. So it was a much more watered down experience than the arcade, but it was a fun experience nonetheless, right? So having an Atari system was the second best thing to being in the um, arcade. This led to home computers or personal computers. Another thing that never existed before that nobody had seen, heard of, used, or touched before and certainly didn't have them in their house. So the idea of a home computer, of a personal computer, was a brand new thing, was a very exciting thing to happen. And so all this stuff was happening all around the same time and it was a perfect age for me because my brain was like a sponge. I was totally into this, I was excited about it, I was turned on by it and I wanted to absorb this and be as much a part of this revolution as possible. And let's look at one of the first most infamous computers. The Apple II computer came out in 1977 for $1,300 with a mere 4K of RAM. Not a lot of memory. You can see here it was connected to a little green screen and I don't think that $1,300 included the green screen. These were some floppy drives that you could attach to the side of it. So this whole system here might have been $1,500. Look at some of the specs here. 4K minimum RAM. You had six colors maximum on your screen. You had a cassette interface. This was basic, basic stuff. Another thing you notice here too is that it came with BASIC. BASIC was a programming language and in these old computers about all you could do was turn them on and have a little prompt and, and write your own software. If you didn't purchase software to load and run there was very little else you could do with the computers and so this had its own version of BASIC. 
Another very, very popular computer for this time was the Atari 800 computer made by Atari. Um, pretty high-end system, really nice colors, really nice graphics, great music. This had dedicated gaming hardware. It had music synthesizers built in. It could make its own music. It could play music in the background, so the games had a nice musical uh, feel to them, similar to the arcades. It had a lot of colors on screen. It also had a, a hardware chip that allowed it to create sprites, and sprites were what were used in the arcade. Your sprite is your little character that moves on the screen, and sprites to be done properly, you had to have dedicated hardware to do that. A lot of the home computers did not have sprite hardware, so it was all done in software. So it was slower, it wasn't as good, but this had sprite hardware. So this was really a fancy gaming system with a keyboard, is what it boiled down to. But it was pretty cool, some really cool games around this time. Here we have my computer. Radio Shack released the Color Computer, 1980. It came out for about 400 bucks when it hit the streets. The first model had 4K of RAM. The one I bought a year later, I think, had about 16K of RAM. And we'll get more into some of the technical aspects of this as I go through here. Another really cool computer system for the time was the Texas Instruments released a computer. This was a model known as the TI-99-4A. I remember playing with these things in the stores. Um, really good colors, really good graphics, great music and sound. Also had sprite hardware for games. And it had a cartridge slot over here on the right hand side. And one of the things that it had was a speech synthesizer cartridge you could plug into it. And I remember hearing some of the games and it had like this robotic voice like the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica had this real, you know, war games type voice. That was a cool feature because most computers and most video games did not talk. They did not have, definitely didn't have recorded human speech and a few of them had robotic speech and it was a cool feature. So this was one of the things that model had. And this computer here, the Commodore 64, which came out a couple years later, is very beloved. Commodore 64 was an amazing computer. One of the first computers to come out with 64K of RAM as its base amount of memory, which was an insane amount of memory for this point in time. Um, really good amount of colors on screen, really good um, music, again, sprite hardware, incredible games that could be played on this thing as well as being a computer. So, um, this was a picture of my computer. This was the book. This book here is how I learned how to program the computer. I was, I want to say 14. Wasn't an, an exceptional student. I really didn't like math. One of the turnoffs for me was when I heard that computers were coming to school and computer classes were available. I was interested, but then I was told, you know what, if you want to be uh, in a computer class, you got to be good at math. And then all of a sudden I was turned off because I hated math. Math was my least favorite subject, so I never took a class. But like everything I've done with computers, I'm pretty much self-taught. I got one, I learned how to use it, I absorbed it, and just got better over time. So this book right here, Getting Started with Color Basic, and look at the little picture of a little friendly dude, you know, a little smiley, happy computer. This was very easy to read, very easy to understand. It was step by step, and I learned how to program basic. I learned how to program a computer. I was actually making my own video games um, over time by doing this. So why did they call this computer the color computer? Because all these computers could generate color at this point in time. Radio Shack went out of its way to say, hey, this is a color computer. Well, here's a little picture. Here's a little reason why. These are two different advertisements from some Radio Shack computer systems. Historically, Radio Shack has also been in the computer game for a long time, but their computers were not personal computers. They weren't home computers. They were more designed for business. But if you look at this picture here on the left, this was their flagship product. They had the Model 1 computer. They had the Model 3 computer. They were all black and white. They had a built-in monitor, built-in keyboard, a couple floppy drives off to the side. These were small business machines, and they were probably $1,500, $2,000 for some of these computers. So this wasn't something the average Joe had in their house. But this was the type of computers that Radio Shack was making. They had a history of making monochrome black and white computers. So when they made their next model, they went out of their way to say, this is a color computer. This isn't like anything else we'd made before. They were basically trying to fit in with the Apples, the Ataris, these computers that were coming out. So that's why they call it the color computer. And that's why the word color is prominently used in almost every single title that ever came out for this. Here's some old uh, magazine advertisements from the day. Again, found all these things on Google. Used to love these, to get these magazines and look and see what was going on. But you can see some of the prices here, $400, $500 for different models. You could upgrade your computers. There were some models that had 
a minimal amount of memory. You could add more memory. There was a standard basic language. There was an extended basic language. So there were ways you could upgrade or you could buy higher end models. I think I did gradually upgrade mine over time. I eventually replaced it with newer models as well. So these were some of the ads of these computers over the years. Very fond of mine. Here's what the screen looked like. This was the computer screen. This was the text. We had 32 columns of text and 16 lines, which was also kind of non-standard. Most computers for the, the television were 40 columns by 24. This was 32 by 16, a little bit different, but they really wanted to make sure that you could see it and it wasn't too blurry. They did a lot of really odd things. They didn't have lowercase characters. The uh, lowercase character set was actually an inverse character set for whatever reason, you know. A lot of things they did we never understood, but we just kind of dealt with it. And there were a maximum of eight colors this computer could produce. You had your green, your yellow, your blue, your red, your white, your cyan, your magenta, your orange. Here we see a close-up of the keyboard. This, um, this keyboard was plastic, very chick chicklity. Um, a lot of the fanboys and haters would definitely make fun of this keyboard because it was nothing like uh, any of the other computer keyboards out there. Um, and this is how I learned to type on two fingers. I learned to type very quickly and very incorrectly using two fingers on this keyboard. It was very tactile, made a lot of noise, um, different, very different. Um, in later models they improved the keyboard, but this was one of the many, let's just say, unique features about this computer. Also the plastic material that it was made out of. This kind of silver color to match some of their Model 1's, Model 3's. One of the urban legends I heard at the time was that this computer was made out of the same type of plastic that the space, the astronauts' helmets were made out of. So this, the space dudes' helmets were made out of the same thing this computer was. So uh, that was one of the things I remember hearing at the time. So um, really interesting keyboard. Now here's a couple of angles from it. Here's the side view. This, is, this would have been the right-hand side of the computer. This is where you would have stuck in a cartridge. Um, they did have cartridges like the Atari. They called them ROM packs. And this is the rear of the unit. If you reach behind it, there was a reset button. Here was your on and off button. This had your channel select. You could switch between which channel you were going to be um, showing up on your television. A couple of joystick ports cassette port serial port this was the back of that unit very interesting looking computer but it was definitely solid and rugged um, piece of plastic here's kind of the whole thing here this is what the computer looked like pretty cool very different for the time I actually thought it looked kind of high-tech for its time um, and there she is in all her glory now here's another interesting peripheral for this thing the controllers once again something that Radio Shack did that was not standard and was not necessarily beloved by many was this type of controller the original Tari controller was a rigid four directional joystick this was a very loosey-goosey um, analog controller which nobody had um, and it did not spring load, wasn't center loaded, and it would just kind of go all over the place. And so um, I'll admit I wasn't crazy about these joysticks for most games because at this time we were thinking in four directions. We were thinking like a four directional stick. We weren't doing fancy games. So to play those traditional games, this wasn't the, the best controller for. However, there were some titles that actually took really good advantage of the fluid analog control of this thing and when I try to play some of those old games now even now on like my Xbox controllers that are analog it's nowhere near as fluid or responsive as this stick was so there were some aspects where this almost was like a mouse where you could get really precise and move around so there were some things about it that I now looking back do appreciate but at the time it was kind of a crappy controller to be honest with you now here's some again pictures I got from the internet um, here's what some of the cartridges look like. These were the cartridges you could purchase. They called them ROM packs that you could snap into the side. And this was a deluxe version of that joystick. I want to say maybe three, four years later, they came out with one that you could spring load. So it was more like a standard thing. And so it took them a while to do that. And you could kind of switch between loosey-goosey or um, tight and rigid. Um, so here's some of the old joysticks. Here's what a newer deluxe joystick looked like. Here's where some of the cartridges look like. They called them ROM packs. And I think they did this for two reasons. I think the primary reason was, 
again, a home computer was something new. A lot of people did not have that. So in order to put things into uh, a framework that people could wrap their brain around, you could have said to somebody, if you were a salesperson in the store, hey, you know that Atari system where you plug in a cartridge? You know, our computer can do the same thing. You can plug a cartridge in and you can play a game just like an Atari. However, you can also do more. You can do finances. You can do budgeting and um, these other things that they tried to, you know, these legitimate applications for the personal computer. Let's be honest, most people got them, because, and I know for me, I got it because I wanted to play games. So the, one of the reasons why they made it in a cartridge was to appeal to the Atari mentality. And the other reason they put them in a cartridge was they believed, and there was a period of time where this was true, that software could not be copied if it was on a cartridge. Now, going back again, certain things have existed since the dawn of time. And when it comes to computers, the freely copying and distributing of software has been going on as long as computers have been around. And one of the main appeals to me, being a kid without a lot of money, disposable income, the fact that I knew, somehow we knew that if we bought a computer, we could get copies of games that we could play at home that we did not have to purchase. Well, that was appealing to me. Matter of fact, my first game was a copy somebody gave me on a cassette. So um, I did not purchase, I would say, the majority of the software I had at this time. I'm not saying that because I'm proud of it now. I was a dumb kid. But that was one of the reasons why we got computers is because we could copy software. And Radio Shack figured, you know what, nobody's going to copy these things. This is a cartridge. You can't copy a cartridge. You know, we figured out a way. We ended up copying these things too. But now here's an actual photograph of me and one of my first computers. And I've highlighted some of the images here. Um, here's my computer. Now look at this old school television that I had. I don't exactly remember where I got this. I'm pretty sure I bought this from a TV repair shop and I'm trying to remember why. I know that to get this computer took me a long time to save and stow away money and I have a feeling that buying a television just wasn't in the cards so I bought a used old black and white television from a TV repair shop and this thing was probably old when I bought it. Uh, and so <laughs> my first computer, which was a color computer, actually ran on an old crappy black and white television. I had some rabbit ears on this television here to uh, watch TV. I don't know what this makeshift cover was. I see some high-end uh, designer masking tape here. I don't know why I had that on there. I don't remember. This was my cassette drive. My first computer, my, I ran on cassettes. It took me a while to save more money and upgrade to a floppy drive later on. Um, and then here's my joystick. I got some rubber bands around this joystick. It was probably falling apart. I don't know what the heck this is. Uh, some type of towel, maybe? Not exactly sure. This was some type of organizing cartridge holder. And this was my first computer. Uh, I didn't even know if I was aware this picture was being taken at the time. But that's a little slice of history for you right there. So that was my first setup. Now, here were some of the games you could get on cassette. And these were some, again, uh, something that was appealing to me were some of these games here. Pyramid, Rakatu, Bedlam, Madness and the Minotaur. These were text-based adventure games. They weren't even graphical. It was like a, an adventure story where you were inside the story and it read things off to you and you had to interact with very basic commands but it was more of a theater of their mind type game you had to use your imagination and imagine where you were solve basic problems learn how to navigate a world and that was again a really interesting game type to me these were some of the earlier computer games were these text adventure type games um, and these were very popular i had a few of these that i had on cassette and some of these even were for the black and white uh, TRS-80 computers, so they had them for a couple different platforms. These were very popular, especially in the 80s. And later on, they introduced a few new models. Here's a, uh, some pictures of the Color Computer 2. Color Computer 2, well, they went from the old silver to white. They actually added a halfway decent keyboard. It looked more like a real computer keyboard that other computers had. Um, and they made it a little bit smaller. It did not go back nearly as deep. Uh, basically the same computer there was really no better processor or better graphics. So there was nothing technologically advanced about it. It was just more cosmetically um, 
appeasing, I guess, um, and they went to a white color scheme. They got away from the silver. So Color Computer 2, um, and, and there was another model of this. I think I've got a picture of that I'll show you here in a second. This was my second color computer. This was the really pimped out Mac Daddy version of the color computer. Still the same form factor as the original, the bigger case, but with a better keyboard. This one, I think, had 64K of RAM, too, so it was maxed out on RAM. And there were a lot of people in the community that were doing some cool stuff if you had more RAM. There were a lot of customizations you could do to your operating system and all kinds of tweaks and some really cool games that took advantage of the extra memory. So this was the second one that I purchased. And here's an actual another picture from my family. I had this in a photo album somewhere. This was my second computer. I had actually added a uh, monochrome monitor to this. This was a cartridge extension unit here. This was called the multi-pack interface where you could plug in your disc controller, additional game cartridges. At this time, they had actually released a music cartridge. The computer could not make background music, so it wasn't like an Atari. People did pretty cool trickery with software to make it sound like the music was playing in the background, but they later on added different cartridges to do that. This was my original floppy drive. That was still, still silver. Everything else here was upgraded to white. My deluxe joystick here. Uh, interestingly enough, too, this monitor, this monochrome composite monitor, once again, I'm going back to not having color on my color computer but I actually we found a place I don't know how we found it because there was no inter there was no internet back then um, but we found a place locally that would modify this computer they had to open it up they had to change out some chips and run some wires out the back of it to kind of ghetto splice in the ability to attach composite monitors so I had this thing modified and this was an amber monitor where they had the green screens this was an amber screen so it looked kind of cool and there were some really cool things to how some of the games looked but again no color on my color computer, but this was my second, this was my pimped out, maxed out system. I'm kind of proud of that. A few years later, they released a really cool computer called the Color Computer 3. Uh, my opinion is probably a little too little too late because this came out around 1986 and the things they added to it by this point were, were way behind. The I think they added 16 colors maximum on screen, which was a, an upgrade from the four colors. Uh, it had more speed, more memory, so there were some technological improvements to it, but it was way behind the times. It's, I really wanted to just tell everybody about this computer, uh, um, what was cool about it, and um, because we can now run these programs through emulators, and I can run these things on my PC now, what I want to do is I want to start doing it like once a week for Thursday, and everybody's big on Throwback Thursday. I want to do a Throwback Thursday old school color computer game. So once a week, I'm going to throw up a game. I'm going to play the game. I'm going to talk about it, what was cool about it, what I liked about it, what was going through my mind. When I played that game, what was going through my mind in the world, in my life back in the 80s. I'll just kind of wax nostalgic with you. So that has been my presentation of the Radio Shack TRS-80 color computer or the Coco, as we call it. And so I hope you enjoyed it. My name has been Stevie Stroh, the original gamer. And if you enjoyed this video, I would really like it if you subscribe to the YouTube channel. One of the things that will help me determine do I want to make a series on this computer is going to be the response I get from this video. How I'm going to know and what's going to motivate me to make more videos and a series of this old computer is by subscribing by liking and by commenting. If I see some numbers and I see that there's not just three people who want to see this, but there's a hundred people who want to see more of this, that'll motivate me to make more videos. So if you like this and you want to see more, subscribe, give me a thumbs up, give me a like, and throw out some comments and tell me what you liked about this and what you'd like to see next. So thank you for watching and I'll see you all next time. Peace out. So this is Caterpillar Attack. This and I'm moving a little dude around. Now I see here that one of my caterpillar heads is stuck in a mushroom. That's a cool feature. Let me see if I can get you out, dude. Spiders move. Here's a little preview of what color computer games look like. This was my first one that I owned. It wasn't the first one I played because I used to play them in the store all the time. I would go to the store and hang out and play the games there. But this was the first game I owned on my first computer. It's called Caterpillar Attack by Tom Mix Software. 
it brings back a lot of memories for me. So I hope you enjoyed that preview. I'm looking forward to seeing how many people are interested in seeing this series about this classic nostalgic computer and what these cool, interesting games from the 80s look like and played like. So if you like it and you want to see more, subscribe to the YouTube channel, give me a like with a thumbs up, and leave a comment and tell me what you want to see next. Thanks for watching this preview. Stevie Stroh, the original gamer, saying peace out for now, people.